We are now going to move on to our next main topic, and that is the topic of church planting models and regional strategies. And this is really one of my uh, favorite sections to talk about because there are just so many different approaches to planting churches, and uh, we'll have a lot of practical examples uh, from around the world here of different ways that churches can be planted and churches can reproduce and how regions, uh, whole regions can be reached uh, by church planting. And so let's start out with approaches to pioneer church planting. And by that we mean planting a church where there are no other churches or where there are very, very few Christians, where you're basically starting with from, from zero. You're starting with with no local believers, maybe there's a team of people coming in or just a couple of believers, but you're really pioneering uh, a church in a new area. And so what are some of the ways that that happens? Well, one of the ways that it's typically been done in the past, probably most often, is by the solo church planter, uh, sort of like a paratrooper. This is uh, uh, one man and maybe his family they move into the city or move into the town, and um, they are going to be pretty much on their own. And in that town, they're just going to start sharing the gospel and trying to lead people to Christ. They really don't have any team. They're on their own. And so I sort of call this person the paratrooper. It's just like that person that on their own, just flying in from outside and somehow trying to find a way to get in touch with people and and lead some people to Christ, and then get a core group going for the church. Now that solo uh, pioneer paratrooper church planter is going to uh, face a lot of challenges. Uh, for one, uh, no single church planter has all the spiritual gifts. Um, for another, there's only so many people that solo church planter can build relationships with. Uh, that person is likely to become discouraged along the way because there's not a support team. There's very few other believers, if any. And so actually the failure rate of church planters of this variety is pretty high. The discouragement sets in. The progress is very slow. Um, now a lot of churches have been planted this way, and it, but it takes a very, very determined, very, very gifted church planter to be able to do this just on their own to go into a new place and plant a church. So we normally don't really recommend this approach. Another approach is colonization or team church planting. And by this, instead of the church planter going into that new location alone, just he and his family, uh, a team is commissioned to go to plant that church. What this usually means is there's going to be maybe three or four families who move into this new community. They get homes, maybe they get jobs there. And in this new community, they begin to start launching the new church plant. Now, the advantage to this idea is pretty clear. You've got a core group of people already that you brought into the new location. So you can pray together, you can encourage one another. On a team, you're going to have different spiritual gifts. And so it's not going to be just dependent on one person being really the powerful evangelist church planner. But you've got other people with other gifts. You can share the load, especially if you're doing a tent making where you don't have a lot of time uh, then you can share those responsibilities among the team. Now, there are a couple of things to keep in mind if you're going to have a team, sort of a church planner, this colonization idea. Because you're bringing in a pre-existing group that are sort of the core of this new church, you have to make sure that that core group has a common vision, common values, they've got the same theology, they have the same basic understanding of what kind of church it should become, the basic philosophy of ministry of how you're going to do evangelism. They've got to be pretty unified on that because you can't have conflict in this little core group or it's going to dissolve before you even get started. So usually they recommend a period of team building where the different team members meet together regularly, they pray together, they begin to think about the, the people they're going to reach, what will be the best approach, the methods they're going to use, and so on. 
So you need a period of team building. The other thing to keep in mind with this approach is that you can give the impression of this team of people that have come in from the outside that they're sort of a clique. They're, they're a closed group. Everybody knows each other. Everybody is on a first name basis. They're, they're friends. They're sort of like a family. And sometimes then when an outsider comes, they feel like, wow, they're, they're all friends. They all know each other. Who am I as an outsider? I don't really fit in this group. And so that team has to make sure that they're very, very open of, of integrating new people into that team, or into that, hopefully, that will become the core of the church. Another thing that can happen is if that team, that core group of people, uh, if they are expatriates, or even if they're from another part of the country, maybe they're, they all built their team up in the north and they move way down in the south. That may give the impression that this church is a church for foreigners. And uh, it's not really local people that would go to that group. That's just the northerners that would go to that group. Uh, this was a little bit of an issue we would run into uh, in working in Germany. The south, Bavaria where we worked, for the most part, uh, was very, very Roman Catholic. And most of the Protestants who lived down there were Northerners who'd moved down there. And so they tended to think, well, if you're a Protestant, you're a Northerner. And uh, so we had to work very hard at overcoming that and, and making sure we had local people that spoke the local dialect. And uh, so we didn't have this foreign image. I think of one church plant that was going on in Germany, and they had a group of several American families that were launching they were the team that was launching this church plant. And each one of these families had several children. And so on Sundays, there were all these little American kids and they're all speaking English with each other. And then the adults, well, some of them didn't know German so well, so they're speaking English to one another. And there was one occasion where a German came in to visit the church on a Sunday. He looked around, he saw all these people speaking English and he said, oh, well, this must be the American church. This must be the international church. Where's the German church? And so you have to watch that if you've got expatriates or people who are clearly from another part of the country, that you work very hard to make sure that it doesn't have that foreign image and people think that this is not something for them. But this is a, a great advantage. Now, one of the churches that I'll be showing to you later, uh, um, Naperville uh, Community Christian Church in Naperville, they have actually sent out families, numerous families, to plant churches in other cities. They sent out, I believe, 25 or 35 members to start churches in places like Kansas City and other cities, where they would literally, from the Chicago area, they would get a team of families who would be willing to uproot, to go get new jobs, and to become the core of that new church. Of course, many of these people were people who were gifted. They were involved in ministry already. They'd been trained to do uh, various ministries, whether it's music or preaching or, or leading groups and so on. So they had a very highly uh, trained, skilled, most of them lay people, that were willing to give up their jobs, sell their homes, move into another city. That's a high level of commitment. Think about this. How many churches do you know? How many Christians do you know would say, I'm willing to give up my job. I'm willing to sell my house. I'm willing to take my kids out of their school we're going to have to get new friends. We're going to move to another city to be a part of a team. But highly missional churches that have a passion for evangelism, passion for church planting, they can motivate people and mobilize people and empower them to go do that kind of thing. And so you're literally like a colonization where a group of people will immigrate to another country to start a new community. You have this group of Christians that were really willing to uproot, move into a new community, and then become the core of that new church. So uh, that group then has a common vision. That group um, has all those advantages of having a team to get started. Another pioneer approach is non-resident or short-term church planting. And this would be sort of more like an itinerant church planting approach where um, the church planter does not actually move and live in that community. Now this, of course, would have to be a very apostolic approach because what that means is that person may be coming, he may spend a couple of weeks in the community, and then leave again. 
may come back a, a couple months later, spend a few weeks, and then leave again. And so this is usually only really done in uh, countries where it's difficult uh, for uh, outsiders to have a visa, or it's difficult for outsiders to get a job. Um, but, uh, and it's very dependent on empowering the local people. Uh, because the leader, the church planter, is only really coming in and going out. Um, he's not staying long term at that location. It does have the advantage of making that church dependent on the local people, uh, which can be positive, but it's, it's a hard way to plant a church. Some organizations have said we will send in a short term team. So the people will not sell their homes, give up their jobs, but they might just go in for one month. A team of people, they'll do evangelism, they'll, you know, they'll be going into schools or they'll be doing music programs, they'll go to the public, public parks and, and do children's programs and they'll have just sort of evangelistic blitz on this city for several weeks. And then hopefully by the end of those several weeks, they will have gathered some new believers and have discipled them enough that they, those, those new believers can become the core of a new church. Now, usually for that to survive, there's going to need to be a pastor or somebody who comes in that gives regular care to that group to help them grow and keep growing in their faith. Um, sometimes what happens is there will be a, a church, say, in a, in a city, but, and then there will be a small group in a village outside of the city. And the pastor of the city church will go and itinerate out to the village to help get that church started. In other words, the pastor doesn't move out and say, I'm going to become a church planter and I'm going to live in this town. But what says, he says, well, you know, it's, maybe it's an hour drive. He says, I'll come out and we'll do Sunday evening. We'll have a Sunday evening meeting and I'll come out once a week and I'll do the Sunday evening meeting, help you get started. And then begins empowering, equipping the people in that group. And so really, that pastor has kind of helped plant that church but he didn't really leave the home church. And this has been done uh, very often also, a way of planning a church where you don't have a resident church planter. And another approach to pioneering is the international church plant. And this is where you may go into a city which is very restricted Christian activity. Uh, let's take, for example, Turkey. It's a Muslim country, and um, it's very difficult to have large groups of Christians meeting, and there are very few Christians there. And so one strategy would be to say, well, we'll start an English language international church, and that will be open for anybody who wants to come. And if you're in a major city, capital city, or one of the major cities, there's probably a lot of other expatriates that live in that city. Many of them will speak English. And they'll say, well, I'll be glad to have a, an English language church I can go to. Now, the language around them might be Arabic, it might be Turkish, um, it might be Russian. But they start this English language international church. And often, if it's a big cosmopolitan city, they can get some international people to come and, and build the core of that church fairly quickly. But there are several challenges. Think for a moment, what are going to be the challenges of this kind of a church? Especially if their real goal is to reach the local people and not just expatriates living in the city. Eventually, they're going to have to transli transition to the local language because there's only so many people who speak English. If the majority speak another language and only a few people in that city speak English, it's obviously going to be very limited. So eventually they're going to have to find a way to transition from being primarily an English speaking to a vernacular speaking church. And that's not always easy because the people you initially attracted because it was an English speaking church may not be happy when it becomes a Russian speaking church or a Turkish speaking church or something else. And so that transition can be difficult. What sometimes is done is they'll start parallel services where there'll be one service in English and they'll start a second service in the vernacular. Another thing that 
is a difficulty with this type of a church plant is it is a very foreign feel to it because all the people, at least initially, that are attending are usually expatriates. They're foreigners. It's a foreign language. The style is going to be foreign. The style of music may seem very foreign. The length of the meetings, the time of day of the meetings, that may all just seem very foreign. And so a local person may come, and even if they do speak English, they may just feel, this is, just, this is not for me. Christianity has the reputation of being a Western religion. Well, that's just something for Europeans. That's just something for Americans. But we're Arabs, or we're Indians, or we're Chinese, or Central Asians. And we're not Christians. That's a Western religion. And so if you expatriates want to have your little Christian church here, fine, but that's only something for foreigners. In fact, some of these international churches actually have government officials at the door checking passports to go to church on Sunday. This is true. Uh, and if you have a national passport, you're not allowed to get in the church. You have to have an international passport to attend the international church. So there's some obvious limitations in that kind of a setting. But one of the hopes with the international church is that, especially in places where it's very difficult to reach the local people, I'll say maybe in a Muslim context, where it's very difficult to reach Muslims. And even if a Muslim becomes a Christian, they, they may be very reluctant to, to be seen entering a, 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 a Christian church. One of the advantages of the international idea is that sometimes you'll get people who just want to practice their English. They know a little bit of English. They want to practice their English. And so they're really not interested in spiritual things. But they'll come to the church because here's a place where I can speak English with other people and English is spoken and so on. Or maybe somebody's looking to make have a relationship with somebody from America or somewhere else. And so you'll have some people come in like this. But then they might have never thought about just seeking out the Bible or Christian, the Christian faith. But because now they've built some relationships with other Christians, they start becoming interested in Christ. And they actually may come to faith in Christ, even though that was not their original intent. So sometimes you do end up reaching a number of people in this way. And so there have been places where there have been actually very strong churches planted in this way. Um, Calvary Chapel in Siegen in Germany uh, was planted using English language. The preacher, as I understand it to this day, even though it's become one of the larger churches in the region of Germany and influenced a lot of young people, uh, as I understand it, many, many years later now since that church was started, the pastor still speaks in English preaches in English with a German translation. Um, so sometimes that works out well. They're reaching a lot of German people. Um, of course, a lot of German people know English well. They've had English in the schools. Uh, in places like Geneva in Switzerland, a very, very international city, um, there's been a very strong international church started there. In Amsterdam, very international city where a lot of people speak English, there's been a strong church started there. There's one other advantage to the international approach, and that is sometimes the, that international church has the freedom to be much more creative. Whereas if it's a Russian language church or a French language church, you're expected to do church a certain way. That's just the traditional way to do it, right? And you just don't change that because that's sort of sacred. Well, the international church comes along and they're not bound by these traditions that are local and they do some creative things. I think of that international church in Amsterdam that did a lot of creative things using drama and, and just the way they, they did their church services and their outreach and so. And what started happening is that some of the Dutch churches started looking and saying, hey, look what they're doing. They're doing some different things and, and they're reaching people. And, Maybe we ought to try some of that. So sometimes that international church has a little bit of advantage of trying some creative methods that actually the local, other local churches may begin to look at and say, hey, maybe we should try that too. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. 
So thus those are some of the advantages and disadvantages of this approach with the international uh, church plant. Then there's what uh, I call indirect church planting. And by that, I mean a group or an organization is working in a location that didn't really plan on planting a church. Uh, it was a Christian organization that was maybe uh, doing community and relief work, uh, food for the hungry, uh, world vision. These are Christian relief organizations that are not there to plant churches. They're there to feed the hungry. They're there to help develop the agricultural work, to help the people have a better life. But they're Christians. And so while they're there doing their development work, some of the local people become Christians. I think of a situation where this happened in Romania. And some of the local people became Christians. But this relief worker says, well, I'm not a church planter. I don't know what to do, um, but these people became Christians and there's no church here. So now what? Well, sometimes they'll look for another organization that does do church planting and invite them to come and help plant this church. Wycliffe Bible Translators or Summer Institute of Linguistics, strictly speaking, they don't plant churches. Um, in fact, sometimes they're allowed to work in certain communities on a contract basis. The government allows them to work there only to the extent that they translate the local language and uh, do literacy program. But then they're supposed to leave. Well, technically they're not there to plant a church, although when they translate the Bible and so on, people become Christians. And um, so then they're involved in helping those Christians become a church, even though that wasn't their original intent. Another scenario is a student ministry. I think of a student ministry that was working in Budapest. And uh, they were leading young people to Christ, but uh, they couldn't find a local church that uh, these young people were accepted at. A lot of the church was very traditional, very rigid. And so they, um, they felt they needed to start a Sunday meeting then for the students. Now they, I don't think they really were planning on starting a church, but they started their Sunday meetings and before you knew it, they basically developed into a church. Although technically it was a student ministry that wasn't supposed to be starting churches, but they ended up starting a church. And in that case, they found another mission organization that does church planting and said, will you come and help us now? And so this is sort of indirect church planting. Sometimes the, the strength of this is the very fact that the person who started that church plant is not a pastor. They're just like a lay person helping like everybody else would and so it really is the local people taking a lot more responsibility. And this person is modeling what it is to just be a lay person and give spiritual leadership. So sometimes these indirect church plants work out fairly well. The weakness, of course, is that there's really not much planning. And sometimes there's, uh, the church is started in a way that in the long run is not going to, to be very helpful uh, because it's not been thought through. It's not been uh, carefully led. Um, the local people have not maybe been trained very well and so on. So there are weaknesses there as well. So these are some of the ways that a pioneer church plant could be started. You can see even here there's several ways that can happen. Uh, generally speaking, the colonization or the church planting team is going to be the strongest way to start a pioneer church plant for all the reasons we've already said.